<clears throat> Party people, Tony Rowe here. Hopefully a quick but informative video today on all of the factors that I think go into choosing and opening and kind of starting to build that repertoire. So I hope that this will be useful for new players who are just starting out or also more experienced players who are maybe looking to switch it up and find something new. And this video comes with an offer of my time. So stick stick around until the end and uh, yeah, see what I'm see what I'm willing to do for you. So let's talk let's talk about broadly choosing an opening. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is if you search for how to choose an opening on on Google, the first thing that comes up and mostly the only thing that comes up is this notion of are you an attacking player or are you a positional player? And frankly, I think that's bullshit. <laughs> if I could be completely honest with you. Um, I don't think opening choice is as significant as people want to make it out to be in, in relation to do you get an attacking position or a positional position? Um, simple examples uh would be that probably the best known attacking player of all time Mikhail Tal um go to chessgames.com and look at what his most common defenses to e4 and d4 were um as black against d4 he overwhelmingly preferred the nimzo indian and the queen's gambit declined which uh on the scale of attacking versus positional i would say sway towards positional the Nimzo Indian may be less so than the Queen's Gambit decline, but um, I think my point stands. Yes, you can find modern Bononis and you can find complex Nidorfs and stuff like that. No question. Uh, but uh, similarly, look at Ulf Anderson, okay? Probably regarded as one of the most technical and dry players of all time. One of my favorites, but you know, not to everyone's taste. And his primary defense against 1e4 was the time on off Sicilian. Um, it's just not that clear to me that opening choices have much to do with whether or not you get an attacking position. And I talked about this a few videos back in my video about Shirov. Most of the, all of the Latvians, really, like the, the Latvians that you think of as attacking wizard, Shirov, uh, Tall, Shabalov, all play relatively classical, straightforward openings as white and black. Um, you know, yeah, semi-Slavs, but again, open Sicilians, classical Roy Lopez's. You probably don't want to play like Petrovs or exchange Slavs. I will grant you that. There are some openings that tend to be more dry than others, but in general, I think you have more freedom than people want to to admit because it makes for easy like you know chess articles to try and get clicks and, and and ad revenue um i think when you're talking about choosing openings based on style you should think more about what you prefer your positions to look like and what i mean by that is what positional factors you're willing to give up or what positional factors you typically shoot for um for instance do you choose tend to choose closed games versus open games of course if you tend to prefer closed games you might play 1d4 instead of 1e4 or at least if you played 1e4 you would tend to not choose variations that open up the game very quickly um do you prefer uh complexity or simplicity you might choose to of course, play into a bunch of very complex main lines, Poison Pawn, Nidors, uh, main line, King's Indian, Mar del Plata's, that sort, Botvinnik Semislavs, if you prefer really complex positions. If you prefer simplicity, you might play exchange variations, like if you decide to play E4, you could play uh, exchange Karl Khan, exchange French, or you could play... Uh, Roy Lopez exchange variations, openings that shoot for exchange of queens right away. And notice that in general, I'm trying to pick things that, that can happen after e4, or d4, or even c4 to it 
to just kind of prove my point that maybe it does uh, another additional point that maybe it doesn't matter that much which opening move you choose there's stuff that you can find everywhere that will generally suit your needs um do you prefer classical uh openings where you generally abide by the standard opening principles put your pawns in the center develop as fast as you can uh your pieces towards the center castle quickly or do you prefer like hyper modern openings where you you avoid declaring uh, a central structure right away or even i it's i don't even know what you call it like neo-modern openings where you know you're going early h4 in the grunfeld or king's indian or uh you're you're playing these carlson-esque positions where you're playing maybe less theoretical moves that don't typically shoot for an advantage but you're just trying to get a fresh position how comfortable are you giving up space? You you might not want to play something like the Peart's or Alakine's defense or even the French, which allows the advance variation. You might be without a little bit of space for quite a long time in variations like that. Um, do you prefer fluid versus rigid pawn structures? Okay, if you if you're fine with fluidity, you might choose openings where you don't declare the central pawn structure right, right away um openings like perhaps the king's indian attack where you can go e4 or c4 depending on on what you like and even after uh let's say c4 in those positions you can you might choose to go into reverse Maroxy binds reverse bononis reverse banco gambits reverse king's indians etc you have a lot of fluidity in the pawn structure Versus something that's much more rigid, like the French advance, for instance, is white, or um, openings where generally all of the the center pawns are exchanged right away, and the game doesn't typically have a lot to do with pawn structure uh, relative to piece piece play, like the Petrov, for instance, or the Scotch, where a lot of pawns in the center tend to get uh, exchanged, and the rest don't get pushed very much, and it's it's mostly about open files, piece play, etc. Um, how comfortable are you giving up material? Do you like to play gambits? Do you not believe in them? I typically don't play a lot of gambits. But some people are into them. That's fine. Uh, do you prefer forcing versus non-forcing variations? Do you want to go very deep into Poison Pawn Nidorfs and have to push theory very far? King's Indian Mar del Plata again. Uh, Banco Gambit accepted. Very forcing lines in the modern main line of the modern Benoni, uh, Marshall gambits, Zaitsev variations. Um, you know, those kinds of things tend to require a lot of memorization, a lot of theoretical understanding versus non forcing variations, slower, more positional ideas, maybe that that you have more freedom to make different choices. You don't need to worry about being in or out of book so much. Do you prefer to play with the bishop pair, or are you fine giving it up? Obviously, openings like the Nimzo Indian or um, Roy Lopez exchange variations, those types of things would hinge very much on whether or not you like to play with the bishops or not. So those are the kinds of positional factors that I'm talking about instead of attacking versus positional. If you think different, let me know what you think in the comments. That's fine with me. Um, if you're liking this video so, so far, please like, subscribe, click that bell, all that YouTube crap. Uh, I'm trying to grow my YouTube channel and that would very much help me out. Um, there are other factors that are not related to the chess position that I think are also very important. Um, how much do you care about improvement versus fun? Of course, if you just care about having fun, you can pretty much do whatever the hell you want. You don't even have to watch this video if you don't want to. Um, Play what you find is fun, that's it. If you're more interested in improvement or results, it becomes more complicated. What's good for your growth versus what's good for your rating right now? Those kinds of questions uh, come into play. I am one of those people that if you're, if you're a new chess player, I would encourage you to play open games and open positions and relatively simple openings first. Um, I think it helps to build a foundation in the open game they tend to be less nuanced and more based on tactics and calculation and simple opening principles like king safety development central control those things are very helpful to build upon later 
games typically don't get more closed, but they do get more open. So it does help, in my opinion, if you care about improvement, to build a strong foundation in the open games. Again, if you don't agree, uh, you know, hit me up in the comments. I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm ready to debate. <laughs> um, how old are you? Age is another thing. Do you have kids? Do you have a busy job? Do you have a girlfriend that takes up all your time and is sucking away all that elo? Of course, you might not want to go and buy Gowan Jones's 3,000 line uh, two-part course on the King's Indian defense. You might want something more like Christoph Selecki's Keep It Simple Black that has 300 lines total, uh, 10 times less, and covers every first move in <laughs> instead of just one D4. Just as an example, you might not want to play like very complex Sicilians if you don't have a lot of time, or you find that in old age you typically do not prefer tactical play or your calculations getting a little slow. I kind of feel that way even uh, now, and I'm only 35. Shout out to those French Ruby players out there. Um, what's your rating? Of course, I already talked about this a little bit. If you're a growing player, I always would encourage you to learn the open games. The less advanced you are, the, the more I feel like some openings should be off limits. Uh, um, or I wouldn't suggest them to you, let's put it that way. Again, if you just want to have fun. I remember at my first chess lesson, I was... I didn't have a rating. I was probably like 1,200 strength. Uh, who knows? 1,300 strength. Uh, my coach and I sat down. He wanted to play a game. I played the Nimzo Larson as, <laughs> as white, and I'm sure he was very disgusted, and he, he very quickly beat that out of me. But, um, yeah, I mean, think about it. If you don't care, then play whatever you want. But uh, I do think that there probably is a rating limit on some openings. I wouldn't encourage a 1,000 player to take up the Peerts or the Modern. I think um, there are openings that are more nuanced and more complicated than others, and there are openings that probably you would do better in if you had a better chess foundation in simpler openings. But up to you. Um, how much do you care about the theoretical merit of your openings. I think it's relatively well accepted at this point that there are sort of tiers to the openings. Um, this comes up more when you're talking about black openings. E5, C5 tend to be the most well-respected. E6, C6 tend to fall sort of in line with that, maybe slightly under. And then you have the rest of the stuff that I think people think is kind of tier three, like the Scandinavian, the Peerts, the modern, Alakine's defense. Um, and then you have stuff that I would consider like relatively risky, like, uh, you know, Owen's defense or that. Uh, what is it? The is it St. George? What's a six? I don't who gives a crap. Um, but th those things, I think you, if you're thinking about playing those, you should be very uh, understanding that if you're if you're taking up the modern or you're taking up uh, Owen's defense or. You know, even the Scandi, you're probably seeding more of a theoretical advantage to white than if you were to take up one E5. There are absolutely practical advantages to taking up those openings, and I talked about this in, in my last uh, video on Alakine's defense. Um, people tend to be less well-prepared against those. Um, so there's surprise value there, but... Yeah, that's something you at least need to consider. Are you okay playing something that's maybe considered a little bit less sound? That's going to be require a little bit more knowledge if you want quote unquote theoretical equality. If you want that engine engine to show zero dot zero zero or whatever, how however important that is to you at your rating level. Um, I wouldn't have a problem recommending anyone anyone uh, any one of my viewers to play the Scandinavian or Alakine's defense as long as you're comfortable with your understanding of those positions, but some people object to those sort of things. Um, um, and and, and there, there are certain like logistical things to think about too, like um, for example, like sharing positions between your E4 and D4 repertoires. A lot of, this isn't super common, but it is possible. Um, just a, a couple of examples, like for instance, um, there's a player named Levin Pansulaya, okay, and I know him because he's mostly a Knight F3, uh, G3 player. 
But uh, as Black, he plays the modern Benoni, and so he's used to seeing positions like this, and then it is possible in these lines that, for instance, White can decline the modern Benoni and go into, like, symmetrical Englishes. And um, one of the things that can happen is, like, Black goes C takes D4 here. That's the usual move. Knight takes D4. And black can go e6, and after knight c3, a6. This position is the same after e4 as the con Sicilian. So e4, c5, knight c3, e6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4. Um, I don't, I don't know. It, it could, it could really be. Uh, let's go a6 because c4 has to be inserted. So, yeah, something like uh, this. This is the same position, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and so he plays both the Con Sicilian and the Modern Benoni. If you play the Con Sicilian, it's very easy in this position. Or, for instance, you can reach this from even uh, like Knight F3, E6, C4, C5, all kinds of different ways. So you can reach these positions from either E4 or D4. So you save some space. Um, you don't need to learn as many quote unquote tabias, okay? Another example would be like in uh, Christoph Selecki's new chessable repertoire, Keep It Simple Black, he recommends the Queen's Gambit and for black. And in this move order, this is the standard Queen's Gambit position. And this move is not as common as Knight F3, I think, or C takes D5, but it is possible. And in this position, he recommends D takes C4. And one of the most popular lines would go something like E3, c5 bishop takes c4 c takes d4 e takes d4 and then knight c6 and probably knight f3 here protecting the d4 pawn okay this position is the same position you can reach from a carol khan panov attack so same exact position but going e4 c6 d4 d5 i'm not a carol khan player uh hold on to your butts here c4 why didn't i research this ahead of time Knight f6, knight c3, and yeah, probably like, yeah, d takes c4, bishop c4, e6, bishop g5, knight c6. Same exact position. So Karol Khan, Hanov attack, and also the queen's gambit with three, uh, bishop g5, or four bishop g5, excuse me, d takes c4. <clears throat> so those kinds of things have, are possible as well. Um, uh, one more example, because I just thought of it, actually. So Accelerated Dragon. Probably the most common and dangerous way for white to play here is the Meroxy Bind. Which, you know, might, might yield you some position like this. Okay, so this, this is a very common Meroxy Bind. You can reach the same position from the King's Indian, classical variation. So, somewhat less common move order. But instead of the main move c5, black can go c, or main move e5, black can go c5, excuse me. And not a, not a lot of dedicated King's Indian players will play this way because of castles, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c6, and you're in a Meroxy bind. But if you already play the Accelerated Dragon, you don't mind playing against Meroxy Bind, you can use this transposition to merge your repertoire and only have to learn about the Meroxy Bind and not the Classical King's Indian and the Meroxy Bind, which is a, the Classical King's Indian is a massive, massive uh, opening undertaking. So things to think about. Um, of course, also like sort of transpositional and... Uh, yeah, similar positions kind of vibes is like can, how, learning how to shrink your repertoire down a little bit, like using transposition. So like one thing I did in the Killer Sicilian when I wrote it is I just instead of trying to figure out how to get a good position against the Mora Gambit, um, I recommended against the Alapin, I recommended going Knight F6, E5, Knight D5, D4, C takes D4. 
which is the same position you get after c5, d4, takes, tier, and then knight f6. White doesn't really have anything better than going e5, knight d5, and transposing to the Alapin. So you can use these kinds of transpositions. They pop up all the time to shrink your repertoire down, at least while you're learning. Um, I very commonly accept the Mora Gambit now, but to save space in a book, or if I'm thinking about someone who's uh, limited on time, I might use simple transpositions like this where possible to limit uh, the theory. Um, and if you, you find, and, and not, not just transpositions, you can find similar positions, quote unquote, that kind of look the same and have similar feel piece placements, ideas, uh, all over the place. Um, just as an example, like a person who likes to play mainline Queen's Gambit accepted positions. Okay, I think the Queen's Gambit accepted is a fantastic um, choice for club players. It eliminates a ton of theory. It's uh, relatively straightforward development. Um, but yeah, like it's something like the main lines here after this. Something like these positions reminds me a lot, in a way, of like stuff you would get in the Queen D8 Scandi, right? Like this here, um, D4, let's say, Knight F6, Bishop C4, um, or maybe Bishop C4 first, Knight F6, Knight F3, and then maybe like uh, A6, I think, is sort of a move here. And if D4, B5, Bishop B3, C5. So like... These positions feel kind of similar to me relative to each other. Um, another sort of odd example is if you play the Kalashnikov, I happen to. Um, you know, those positions, you get positions like this, like all the time, right? Um, there are similar, they're not exactly the same, but there are similar lines in the symmetrical English that go like knight f3, knight c6. If white chooses to go d4 here, you can play e5 in this position. Fairly reasonable. And after knight uh, b5, black goes d6 to stop this. And after knight 1 to c3, a6, knight a3, you have a position that is quote-unquote Kalashnikov-esque. Um, yeah, and again, I, I could go on and on with positions that are so sort of similar. Um, you, you'll see recommended on the internet all the time, like, okay, if you're a uh, Slav player, you might enjoy playing the Karo Khan as, as, uh, against E4. I'm not sure how, how, how much these things help, but they're worth thinking about. Um, an extreme version of similar positions would be, like, reversed positions right so like if you're a dutch player and you really like the leningrad dutch okay and you love playing these structures you can play them as white <laughs> you can just start with this and after d5 just play the same same stuff um reverse openings tend to not be as similar as a lot of people would like them to be just that that tempo and the having to declare your intentions one move early is uh surprisingly relevant but it is possible um if you're a person who loves the sicilian defense you play like the dragon accelerated dragon you might love to play the english because all c4 e5 g3 positions are really versions of open sicilians or anti-sicilians reversed right like this is a reverse dragon perhaps this is the most famous one it's really a reverse accelerated dragon that's a lot of words to say, though. Um, you know, this is kind of a reversed Alapin. And again, White's choices are basically the same as against the Alapin. Something like this is a reverse Grand Prix attack. Something like uh, this is a reversed closed Sicilian, for instance. So um, if you like the Botfinic structure, this sort of structure where... Let's say something like this, where white goes c4, e4, g3, bishop, g2. You can also play those in some positions as black. So e4, c5, knight, c3. This is, again, something that I recommended in the, the Killer Sicilian. 
you can play these these styles of positions uh, as black as well. Like for instance, against Bishop E3, you can go E5. Very reasonable, set up the same Botvinnik structure. You can play it in the symmetrical English as well. So after C4, this is a totally acceptable way to play chess. So utilizing these common structures, you can utilize them in reverse too. If you play the London is white, just as an example, or let's say against the King's Indian is maybe a more appropriate comparison. Okay, so like if you really, this is your jam is white, God help your soul. <laughs> um, uh, against the the ready opening, it's basic. Oop, this is basically a London system reversed. Okay, so this kind of stuff pops up all the time. And if you like the look and feel, uh, by all means, go nuts. Okay, um, so like light themed, light squared strategies versus dark squared strategies, just something to consider is some people tend to find uh, comfort in playing on either the light squares or the dark squares. These are kind of overused in my opinion as well. This is again, like falls into like the Karo Khan Slav sort of recommendation where they both tend to place their pawns and pieces uh, and central control uh, hinging on light squares. Okay, so like, you know, the Slav, something like uh, this, right? A4, Bishop C5. Black tends to put his pawns on light squares put his pieces controlling the light squares in the center, a so-called light squared strategy. Some people would call like the English a light squared strategy as well, right? Like same sort of stuff I showed last time, the bishop on g2, the knight on c3, and the pawn that used to be on c4 all tend to accentuate control over one color complex. Um, whereas like, let's say something like uh, the Peart's, people would typically call this like a dark squared strategy for black. You're usually going to go C5 or E5. Your bishop and your pawns in the center tend to accentuate uh, control over the, the dark squares or emphasize control over the dark, dark squares, excuse me. Um, and you'll, you'll frequently see like a lot of people who prefer dark squares as black will play dark squared strategies for both. Like for instance... Uh, Tamor Rajabov is like a Kalashnikov player and also a King's Indian player, right? Pawns and pieces controlling the dark squares. Same sort of thing in the King's Indian, right? Like you'll see pawns and pieces typically on and controlling the dark squares, right? Um, Well-known streamer, YouTube personality, darling of the chess world, John Bartholomew, I would say, tends to prefer light squared strategies, right? Like the Scandi is a light squared strategy. You're going to put your bishop on g4 or f5. You're going to put your pawns on light squares. Your knight is going to control the light squares in the center, that sort of thing. Similarly, he plays like the Slav um, a lot or semi-Slav maybe um, as uh, as black. So like not super surprising. So just one more thing to think about is this light squared versus dark squared thing. If you have something that you already like against e4 and it tends to be a dark squared strategy, maybe if you're searching for a, a repertoire against d4, look for a dark squared strategy. Think about it anyway. Um, another thing you can do is steal the openings of your favorite players. So I really like Bent Larson. I've looked at his profile on chessames.com tons of times just to see like what he played as black against E4, D4, C4, what he played as white. I've done the same where, um, you know, if you have, uh, let's say, one opening that you like a lot and it works for you, like, for instance, the I really like 6B3 against the King's Indian in this sort of like ready or King's Indian attack move order, right? So like I might reach the King's Indian like this where I haven't committed to C4 yet. And uh, I go B3 here. So I look this position up in a database. I can sort those position uh, by like the white players. And you can do this in Skid. You can do it in chess play base. You can also do it on like chessgames.com, but it's a little bit harder. Um, but Skid's free. You can download a database for free. Um, you can't really do this on Lee Chess. I'm, I'm trying to wear them down a little bit. But yeah, like 
get to this position, sort by white player name, and just scroll through and see who's played this position a lot. And then if you're looking for, let's say, okay, like I'm having trouble against the Grunfeld, what do players who play 6b3 against the King's Indian, because I love this, this position a lot, what do they play against the Grunfeld? Or I really like the Grunfeld is black, and I know Peter's Fiddler plays the Grunfeld. What does he play against 1e4? Like uh, um, maybe there's a higher, higher probability that what great Grunfeld players like Sfiddler, Nepo, Avrook, whoever play against e4 maybe i'll like that too that's that's another idea okay i've done like like one of the reasons why i worked with georg meyer as a coach for instance is like i knew i liked knight f3 g3 bishop g2 c4 strategies um and i started copying his e4 repertoire with like the french rubenstein etc and so i thought like okay what else can i learn from this guy um because we stylistically were similar um couple of other quick things whether or not you should consider system openings i am slightly more uh bullish on on uh is bullish negative i think it is uh, uh, against system openings i would not typically recommend a lot of people to play like the london system for instance or like the king's indian attack in the way that some people would play the king's indian attack where you're going to play it's usually for even from a one E four move order where you're going to play like this stuff against literally any moves, no matter what. Um, and to be clear, I'm fine with this. If you're going to treat all of the resulting black positions as different positions that are nuanced, where your moves and understanding of the positions change. I'm not a big fan of people just like playing system ish openings to get a position and then being like, I'll figure it out. Um, I think the opening is kind of like a serve and the stronger serve you have, the more likely it is that you're going to win a volley. And if you're lazy in the opening and you just hope to get a volley, an equal volley, like you're more likely to split those volleys than if you slam, you know, uh, a 120 mile an hour serve over the net and, and force them to try and uh, figure it out. Right. Like I think you should, even if you're playing stuff like the King's Indian or the London system, I think you should know it well. I think you should understand the nuances of the different black setups and and uh, be pushing for uh, an advantage in positions that you understand better than your opponent. So if you think you can do that with a system opening, by all means, I wouldn't recommend it if you think it's a way to lazily avoid studying openings, period. Um, and the last thing I, I'd like to talk about is just making sure that when you choose something, you're consistent across like the flank opening as, as well because of how many transpositional possibilities there are uh, between them. So like if you plan to meet, let's say, one knight f3 with c5, you better damn well play the Sicilian because e4 is possible here. Um, or like if you're a King's Indian player, you probably don't want to meet one knight f3 with d5, of course, because d4 is possible and then you've gotten to a double queen's pawn opening by accident, right? Um, or like if you if you want to meet, uh, yeah, knight f3, d4, uh, c4 with e6, but you're a Slav player, this would be a problem, right? So, like, I would encourage you against knight f3 and c4 to, to pick a move that is consistent with what you play against d4, for instance, just to make sure that transpositionally you're you're in good shape. So that's another thing you have to consider when when thinking about, especially openings against d4 and the flank openings, is, is how to transpose back and limit uh, your opponent's options in the flank openings um, overall, right? So those are all the factors um, that I that I would like to mention as far as like what might help you guys select openings uh, for yourselves. And in the uh, what I'm going to do for you is I, anyone who watches my videos uh, will notice that I respond to or I try to respond to literally every comment that is placed on my YouTube channel. Um, and this video is going to be no different. Uh, if you just respond, hey, Tone, love the video, uh, I will, as usual, um, leave a nice note. But if you comment with 
opening repertoire questions, I will also do my best to be your coach for a minute or two and suggest openings if you're looking for new ones. Um, or if you're having trouble picking something, I will answer your questions below. So just leave a, leave a comment, like, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will do my best. And of course, the more descriptive you are, the better I will be able to help you and the more nuanced I will be uh, with my answer. So, you know, again, all of the factors like open versus closed positions, complex versus simple, classical versus hypermodern versus you don't care, space, uh, bishop versus knight, uh, rigid versus fluid pawn structures, gambits, forcing versus non-forcing, how old you are, whether or not you're just about fun or improvement, what's your age, what's your rating, that kind of stuff, like what you play already that you like, who your favorite players are, um, whether or not you like dark squared, light squared strategies, all that stuff will help me to recommend you new openings and being as descriptive as possible about your problems be like not if you comment with i need an opening versus one d4 i will just be like king's indian or nimzo indian at random i'll suggest you something very venerable and great but if if you go hey uh i played the king's indian already it was a little too theoretical i like double-edged positions um i don't mind accepting a little risk i prefer it's i prefer it uh to be you know, relatively closed, semi-closed, uh, fluid pawn structure, I might be like, hey man, like the Leningrad Dutch sounds like a great option for you. It's a little bit less work than the King's Indian, that kind of thing. So think about it. Um, and that's uh, really all I have to say. As far as like practicing these openings go, there are all kinds of options now. There are digital options like Chessable, um, I'm not sure if chess ply is still around, but I like that one for just loading a PGN in and practicing your repertoire. Chess Tempo um, members can do the same. I've been trying to convince Lee Chess to do this for ages to no avail. Hopefully one day that will exist. Um, I'm also a big fan of just busting out a book or busting out a set and, and studying from books that way. I find having to actually move the pieces around and when you when you get to the end of a variation, setting up the position that that you were branching off from, etc., from memory, going back, that helps a lot. So I'm not against books either. I love books in that way. Um, I'm a big fan of playing like three minute, three plus two games in bulk to just get a feel for an opening, get a lot of data quickly. If you only play long games or you only play your club once a week, like you don't get enough games with an opening to really feel it right so like playing blitz i think is a great way to to build up experience with an opening it allows you to you know use the lee chess database to um and the opening explorer to figure out where you went wrong um again like the individual lee chess database as an aside is an amazing way to analyze your repertoire like where you're having problems where you might need a new option what what you've scored best with in the past, like use the opening explorer. Oh, it's an amazing, amazing tool. Um, and the last one is I would say like, oh, you want to learn how to play something? Like just go through tons of games in bulk. Go to chess games, go to Lee Chess uh, database. Just click on 10, 15, 20 games all from the same position. Flip through them really fast. Um, see where all the pieces go. See where, where the pawn breaks are. See, uh, you know, who's playing on which flank uh that typical tactics those sort of things all that you can see by just viewing a ton of games quickly you're not going to gain a really nuanced understanding but you'll gain a quick perspective on what the resulting middle games positions look like all that so i think that is also a very useful tool for studying openings and getting a feel for what to do relatively quickly so again if you guys have any comments uh questions drop them down below it has been a pleasure. This one was a lot of talking and not a lot of chess, but I hope it is useful for, for uh, new players and experienced players alike. Tony Rowe, signing off. Peace.